Chapter 3. Treading water in the deals lane. Welcome to Singapore, the land that fun forgot. Sion has graciously decided to not only completely overpay me, they're also stumping up for my accommodation in one of Singapore's swankiest bachelor pads. I now dwell on the 17th floor of the abode. My apartment complex is literally called the abode. In the inner city suburb of Somerset, from the balcony I look out through the heat to the monstrosity of Marina Bay Sands. A concrete boat, 56 floors above Singapore's Marina Bay, held aloft by three individual hotel room-filled towers. I would love to meet the person who pitched the idea of this airborne serpentine rudderless eyesore of a ship to the ultra-conservative Singaporean government officials and held a straight face, rambling corporate-speak nonsense, clicking through a slideshow of illustrations demonstrating just how thoroughly you can render your country a laughingstock. Simply place a boat a few hundred metres into the 110% humidity air. I'm told it is a very popular place to jump from, at least one suicide per week. Presumably, the Einstein who commissioned the project was the first to plummet to his voluntary death. Though, this airborne atrocity is precariously close to the casino, one of the few legal gambling facilities and a part of the world immensely rich with degenerate punters. Splat jack extraordinaires must surely flatline the Marina Bay walkway pavement in the early hours of most mornings. I jump in the shower, shave carefully and put on the suit and tie outfit of all modern day heroes. I take off out the door after one last look in the mirror. Smash it, killer. My sweat glands are already preparing for a full-scale assault before the elevator even reaches the ground floor. I walk out of the abode and, less than 10 metres into my journey, I take off the suit jacket. It's so stinking hot here. I'm waiting for the train at Somerset Station, sweat glistening on my temples and lathering incessantly down my back and chest. It cannot be healthy to be losing this much fluid while doing nothing more than standing still, though there must be a sizable dose of first-day nerves synapsing through me. Those will be under control soon. One more hour. I'll be so confused and out of my depth, I won't have a spare brain cell to occupy itself with worry. The train arrives and I cram in with an ethnically diverse assortment of fellow corporate go-getters, all of us overheating in business attire completely inappropriate for a near-zero latitude CBD. We set off and air conditioning jets through the cabin, allowing the flow of sweat to pause momentarily and the soggy waft of BO to permeate. It's a short journey, three stops, destination, a raffles place, an aptly named location for Singapore's epicentre of trading and finance. I somehow plucked my raffle ticket through a combination of a hyperinflated resume, fortuitous interviewer selections and a timely knack for laying my best wares on show when it's time to simulate. I'm hoping my raffle ticket is a winner. I shoot skyward in the same elevator I travelled in only weeks earlier, bright-eyed after the Saturday morning flight here from Sydney for an interview. I'm still spinning from the chain of events leading me back here. Delusions of my own grandeur keep me grounded. I reason that maybe, just maybe, I am as smart as the big swingers at my new firm seem to think I am. The elevator opens to the Scion lobby. Two yellow, fever-inducing Singaporean women sit with perfect posture behind the reception desk. Divided from me by the security of the access card automated sliding glass doors. I step towards the glass. My Anglo appearance, smart suit and short back and sides haircut allows the receptionist to assess me as no threat to security. Silly girls. The truth is, if my deranged trading skills are afforded a large enough line of credit and access to the appropriate buttons, I could blow this place up with ease. Financially speaking, of course. Any terrorist wannabe can tuck explosives in his pants, walk into an innocent crowd, preach the usual compost regarding a human-formulated god, and ignite a genocide bomb. Well done, rookie. But if you sincerely want to inflict hell on civilised Western society, invest a few years in a degree like financial engineering, snake yourself high in the ranks of a bank, insurance company, or ratings agency, and unleash the fury. These financial engineering terrorist masterminds in tan slacks and short sleeve button-up shirts, cloaked in standard deviations and swimming with black swans, lounging in the comfort of ergonomic chairs high up in the revered offices of AAA-rated organisations, must look at Bin Laden et al. and laugh. What amateurs. The moderately less attractive of the two receptionists, body from heaven, face from purgatory, clothing from Prada, steps forwards with remarkable ease, considering the height of her heels must be in excess of half the length of her shin, she pushes the green button on the wall, opening the doors, and the scent of my first moment in well-paid cuntiness is enriched by her tang of freshly waxed office hoe. Hello, I'm Flynn James. 
I'm starting today on the Junior Trader Program. Of course. Please take a seat. I'll call Angela to let her know you've arrived. Would you like a coffee, tea, a bottle of water? This Southeast Asian beauty speaks with a refined, almost British accent. How majestic. Stealing another glance of her Victoria's secret physique, however, I'm sure the accent isn't the driving reason for her employment. No thanks, I'm fine. Angela is the HR manager whose psychotically enthusiastic smile formed my first impression of my new employer. She greets me once more with that terrifyingly cheerful face. Within 45 minutes, she explains all the policies on any number of matters I pay no attention to and could not care less about. Sick leave, gym memberships, family healthcare insurance plans. I don't give a fuck. Just pay me my salary, I'll sort out the rest. If everyone thought like me, the world would obviously be in hedonistic shambles. But at least all these human resources professionals would be in the dull queue where they belong. Mercifully, the orientation is finally complete. It's time to get a seat and a phone, a computer and a boss, and work out what the hell the physical commodities trading caper is really all about, as well as find an answer to the burning question. Just how much of my soul am I expected to sell to justify the salary I'm being paid? I'm assuming the lot, and then some. Angela hands me my security access pass, complete with my pretty little photo in the middle. Well, hello, handsome. We take the lift down a level to the core of Scion Singapore office. Exiting the elevator on the 24th floor, I look past the countless rows of desks, busybodies and endless computers, through the floor-to-ceiling glass windows, and I immediately notice my serpentine comrade across the harbour. Looking his usual shade of ridiculous atop Marina Bay Sands, the welcome tour begins. To your right is the finance and credit department. They appear, as you'd expect, dull. Gotcha. I look forward to seeing their antics after a few drinks. Never trust the quiet ones. On we go. Angela walks with speed and purpose. Her finely formed legs distract me slightly as she continues down the room. These are our ferrous and coal traders. A group of ten portly gents look me over. They each bear a striking resemblance to the sort of man a circus reserves for dressing in leather and firing cannonballs into. They don't appear overly chummy, obviously jealous of the clear gap between my chin and chest, medically referred to as a neck. Theirs are distant memories covered in jowls of pelican gullet impersonations. I recognise John, my round one assessor in Geneva. Oh, hi there, geese. It's Flynn, right? Pleasure to welcome you aboard, son. John's cockney accent diverts my attention from the bratverse fingers protruding from his pufferfish hand as he's grasping golf's mind in a bone-rattling handshake. Yeah, John, thanks, mate. Uh, it's great to be here. I won't be able to type for a few hours. My hand is numb. Anything you need, you just shout all right, geese. Uh, you betcha. Thanks. The tour continues. This is our metals trading team. Copper, zinc, lead, aluminium, scrap. Even before Angela finishes her sentence, the Serbian scrap metal human personification of infuriated is on the approach. Is he smiling? Flynn, hello, welcome. Why you say to Joe I don't like you? I like your nails. It's great to have you here. This is a welcome contradiction to the kneecapping I was preparing for as he approached. Oh, Adam, how are you? Oh, sorry about that, mate. I thought I didn't have a good interview with you, that's all. But I like you. Sorry for the confusion. Adam shakes my hand and takes it a step further. We hug it out in a romantic Eastern European embrace. Angela continues down the room. The big cheese smirks in his chair, seeing Angela and I in the approach. Well, well, what's this about then, Angela? I mean, really, what the bloody hell's going on here? Joel. A born shit stirrer, I hope. Uh, Mr. Ryan, I'm sorry, is there a problem? Angela's voice is quivering. Why'd you let this bloody fool in here? Let me guess, he's Australian, I presume. Please call security. Have him removed immediately. Good day. Joel turns around, walks away. Um, Flynn, please come with me. Well, that was a speedy stint in commodities trading. Easy come, easy go, I guess. Joel turns back. Wait, wait. I changed my mind. He can stay. Smile, Angela. It's Monday morning. Smile. Five full uninterrupted days of adding value to look forward to. Flynn, mate. How are you then, sir? All right? Oh, well, thanks. How are you? Look at me. Look at me. I feel almost as terrible as I look. Now, that's enough about me. Go meet Jana over there. You're on her team now. She'll whip you into shape, boy. Literally. Wait till you see her whip. You'll love it, you filthy bugger. Joel grabs his ringing blackberry from his pocket. Well, how the fuck are you then, cunt face? And saunters away down the room, radiating the aura of complete command. Angela leads me the final steps of the welcoming tour to Jana's desk, three down from Joel's. 
while Andrew, the South African from my original interview with Joel, makes eye contact from a few rows away. He gives me a nod, a wink, and a peculiar sort of Colonel Jessup salute. Hi, Jenna. Please meet Flynn. He is starting today on the Junior Trader Program and will be in your deals desk team. Jenna turns in her seat and we shake hands. She can't be over 30 years old, but the bags under her eyes carry plenty of excess luggage. Hi, Flynn. We'll chat tomorrow. I'm very busy today. See the geek over there with the thick glasses? That's Christian. There's a spare seat next to him, all set up with computer, phone. You sit with him today. He'll teach you some things. She immediately turns back to her seat once these words are delivered, sneezing as she scrolls across a manic-looking spreadsheet. No problem, Jana. I'll speak tomorrow. Thanks. As I say this, she's already on the phone to someone. This makes no sense, retard. You better explain this garbage clearly. You've got ten seconds. One, two. Angela's tour has one final stop. As we round another row of desks, I catch a glimpse of Sebastian, Michael Phelps's Spanish swim training buddy. He looks up from his computer, smiling hello as I walk past. He is one of the five to simulate into a role as well. Maybe yoga is the answer. Christian, good morning. Please meet Flynn. He is starting today on the Junior Trader Program. Of course, the Australian, yes. Christian's eyes seem to light up, though it's hard to tell. They are essentially unreadable beneath his almost translucent specs. Is he blind? The lenses are so substantial. When trying to make eye contact with him, I feel I'm peering into another dimension. Good morning, Christian. He stands to shake hands. I notice some sort of friendship band on his wrist. The type all German backpackers sport when they've successfully hiked through Thailand without ruining their Birkenstocks or befriending a soul. Please, call me Chris. Take a seat, mate. He hams up the mate. Only Australians can say mate properly, mate. Thanks. Okay, Flynn, IT will be along soon to set up your computer and arrange your Blackberry. If there are any problems, please contact me. No problem, Angela. Thank you. Here comes the IT guy now. This will take half an hour to sort your shit. Let's get started as soon as you're ready. Mate. Christian seems nice enough, I guess. Cuntish, of course. But I suppose that's normal. The IT fella, Erwin, sets about doing all manner of things to the phone and three computer screens in front of me. I sit back and peruse the room. There look to be about 150 people here. The majority appear to be of Asian descent. The remaining Caucasians all seem to be recognisable to me already from the various stages of the interview process. Obviously, the top brass is imported. Imperialism is alive and well. Okay, Flynn. Please contact me. Any problem? Think all okay. Oh, cheers, Owen. Thanks, buddy. Christian leans across and takes the reins, handing me a notebook and a pen as he domineers the keyboard and mouse, flying through all sorts of programs, spreadsheets, systems, etc., which coordinate every facet of the business from a chaotic rabble into Microsoft-dependent utopia. At some stage, I feel on the edge of passing out in an information overload-induced coma. Three hours pass in a wink. Okay, that's enough for the time being. Let's go some lunch. Yeah, yeah, sounds good to me. Christian's barely see-through glasses have not prevented him from concisely introducing me to every aspect of my role for the next six months. It's called Deals Desk. In the physical commodities trading world, unlike an investment bank, there is no back, middle and front office division of labour, class, equality and salary. An investment bank likes to have a back office, a place where all the nitty-gritty of trade reconciliation and such tasks are completed. These chores are now routinely outsourced to India, where a willing population provides abundant cheap labour with an unnerving pursuit to not waste precious time thinking in their job. Rather, an adoration of following orders and flowcharts signifies the foundation of a meaningful career. Then, there is the middle office, filled with those irritating accountant, lawyer and risk management types. The sort of highly educated retards who like to think they're entitled to hefty paychecks, even though their contribution to the wealth creation component of entrepreneurship is non-existent. They stitch designer labels onto their cheap suits, buy the highest quality fake Rolexes, visit art galleries, watch foreign films, spend the majority of their workday planning trips to Cinque Terre, frowning at their share portfolios at inevitably planets, or a return to university to study something meaningful. Most assuredly, These fine folk always turn up to work functions with their drinking shoes on if, and only if, the tab is to be footed by a director. Real salt of the earth types in the middle office. Then you have the front office with the analysts, brokers, traders and deal makers. The 5% of the bank's population tasked with feeding fat profits to the remaining 95%. Through a combination of front running and colluding, blatant lying and reckless punting, clever manipulating and occasional brown paper bag filled inducement levering to the regulation controllers of officialdom. You know, 
the typical foundations of successful capitalism and the ruthless upholding of the best interests of the shareholders. What would the world come to if concern ever veered from the best interests of those noble shareholders? And let's not forget that other defining characteristic of an investment bank, the most aptly named Chinese war. A wondrous war designed to keep all those filthy Mongolians out and never let traders talk shop with the merger and acquisition folk. There's a conflict of interests apparently, though their collective salaries and bonuses are drawn from the same dollar mine, interestingly enough. No, the wall is insurmountable, of course it is, it must be. Just Google any random graph of a company's stock price against the news release parameter. You'll find a remarkably unavoidable trend. A stock price's sharp rise or drastic fall, always, every single time, always precedes the release of news. Precedes it, always. How strange. What a coincidence. It wouldn't be like the Chinese to build a faulty wall, would it? The commodities trading world is an entirely different beast. There is no peculiar division of labour into front, middle, back, sideways, diagonal or oblique office environments. Not here. There are traders. Unsurprisingly, they trade. Buy something, sell something, buy something else, sell it, hopefully, for them, at a profit. If not, adios, amigo. They don't sit in some ornate front office with Greek gods, crystal balls and polished knobs. They're here in the same corporate den as everyone else, overwhelmed by enough computer screens to ensure Bill Gates' pension fund remains in strong shape and saddled with the expectation of alchemy every single day. Turn nothing into something. Make wads of profit appear from thin air. How hard can it be? The traders seem predominantly to sit right next to their operator. An operator appears to be a logistics expert. Sleeves rolled up, pencil in the ear, belly overhanging the belt. They're tasked with knowing precisely when and where a vessel is due to arrive, whether all the correct paperwork is dotted and crossed with I's and T's, and most importantly, is the oil or metal or whatever the commodity is meant to be, is it precisely what has been agreed to in the contract? If the assay is indeed of a higher grade than anticipated and contractually agreed, button the lip, pray the counterparty doesn't notice and report the profit, alchemy complete, gainful employment insured for another day. If the assay report shows an inferior speck of material, shout loud, shout fucking loud, and make sure the counterparty stumps up a fortune to compensate, or simply refuse to accept the off-spec shit. Let them know you have good friends in low places who aren't afraid to get the message across in medieval terms of communication. Owing to the fact that physical commodities on the whole are shipped around the world, there's a large chartering team. Some commodities are obviously transported by rail, truck, wheelbarrow, whatever pleb device you can put wheels on. But we're big boys here, big swingers. We ship shit. We ship a global. So we need a group of drastically overpaid taxi booking agents for giant tankers filled with oil, or copper, iron ore, or coal. For some reason I'm unaware of, chartering is an empire almost entirely full of Danish natives. The Great Danes have some affinity with shipping, like Australians with barbecues, Brazilians with waxing, and Colombians with cartels. Enough about them. Let's focus on me. I'm three hours deep into my deals desk career. The deals desk role involves overseeing every aspect of a trader's specific portfolio of deals. This comprises trade reconciliation, risk reporting, cost forecasting of all aspects associated with each trade, ensuring trade contracts are watertight, creating and executing the appropriate hedging plan to offset any pricing risk throughout the trade's life from agreement to delivery, and, most critically, being able to answer any questions a trader may have regarding his cargoes within nanoseconds. If this were an investment bank... I would be tiptoeing between the front, middle and back offices like a financial vigilante ballerina by performing all these tasks from the one desk. Here though, no one blinks. The conflict of being able to complete the hedging trades for a deal while also filing risk reports and making cost forecasts does not appear to bother anyone in this office. So I can only assume it bothers no one in the other commodities trading firms and multinational oil behemoths. Fair enough. Investment banks employ far too many people anyway. I'm happy to see a dozen roles absorbed into one. Jana is in charge of the deals desk team. The bags under her eyes now make a lot more sense. Her team comprises eight super bright young people overseeing every trade completed across all components of the oil barrel, from crude to gasoline to NAFTA. NAFTA. That realm my interviewer Pranav is apparently so gifted at. Where is that little prick anyway? Christian tells me there are 30 oil traders in the Singapore office, meaning there's no shortage of work for the deals desk team to fuck up and Jana to be responsible for. Essentially... A trader will try to swiftly double-check the likely profitability of a deal with his allotted deals desk member before executing it, and will then proceed or not with the deal, usually with the counterparty simultaneously on the end of the phone or some online messenger device. 
It's important to clarify these aren't insignificant sums involved. To charter a tanker, fill it up with some form of oil, insure the lot, hedge the pricing risk, yada, yada, yada. The usual dollar commitment can range from 10 to $100 million. And this isn't a foreign exchange dealing desk. It's very unlikely you've got a phone in each hand with a willing buyer on the one line and a keen seller on the other. Simply quote each party a tidy little spread, seal the deal, clip the profit and head off to lunch, clicking your heels together while singing along to Tina Turner's Simply the Best. No, your chartered tanker full of purchased oil with borrowed cash is most likely going to be sitting in the watery abyss of the Atlantic, Pacific or Indian for a short while, before knowing exactly where the, with any fucking luck, profitable delivery destination is. With all this at stake, a deals desk role carries with it the high probability of being physically beaten to a pulp if you report incorrectly to the trader. Fuck him, he'll fuck you. Eye for an eye, fuck for a fuck. As a member of the Junior Trader Program, I'm expected to absolutely master this deals desk role within six months, and then complete a further six months in operations. Master that little chestnut too, naturally, in Shanghai no less, home of the revered dragon and the succulent dog and then be a trading superstar before I blink. No pressure. I won't let the pulsing headache from this morning's crash course bother me. My future's laid out. There was a hawker market around the corner. A great food. You like Asian food? Yeah, of course. Well, let's go then. We ride the lift back down to the perpetual humidity of ground-level Singapore. The hawker market is two blocks away. Any further and I would not be able to wear this shirt again. I can already feel sweat congealing around the collar of my fresh white shirt into a putrid smoker's teeth stained yellow. We arrive at La Passat, a circus-shaped arena of Asian cuisine, the hazy air infused with cafe lime, peanut oil and MSG. My favourite is this Korean barbecue, but feel free to have a walk around and just grab whatever. All the stalls are excellent. Meet back here in five. La Passat is filling rapidly. The lunchtime rush of corporate mouth is drooling and set to pounce. I decide to leave the stall exploring for another time and join the line at the Korean place with Christian. I'm not too familiar with the menu. I order some sort of cowbell hung chicken noodle soup dish with mild chilli and we take a seat. Well, how do you like it so far then? Ah, uh, not too sure about this food, mate. I sweat enough here already without adding chilli to the system. Not the food, you idiot. This morning at work. How's he feeling? All oh, right, yeah, pretty confused. But it's really interesting. Thanks for your help. I feel like I've learnt so much already. Oh, no problem. I'm on the junior trader program too, you know. I completed the trader exam last week in Geneva. The exam? Yes, they haven't told you. At the conclusion of your 12 months on Deal's desk and operations, you have to be nominated by one of the senior traders to actually sit a final exam before becoming a trader. Oh, okay. I wasn't aware of that. Yes, John nominated me, of course. The exam is spread over four days. Each day is filled with all those simulation-type training exercises, negotiation tasks. Then, most evenings, they try to get you really drunk. So as you will struggle the following day, these smart asses. It's fun, though. I found it very easy, of course. I've already traded oil at Goldman Sachs. I only took this downgrade for 12 months because I wanted to trade in a commodities firm. The bonuses at the banks are pitiful nowadays, since the whole GFC, the whole shit show. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I'm actually from Germany, so a move back to that part of the world would be nice. I can trade anything. I have a feel for it. It just comes so easily. So naturally. Joel should be able to tell me this week where I'm starting my trading. Oh, that's good news then, mate. You'll smash it, I'm sure. Christian has now graduated from cunt-ish to a herpes-riddled gash with this little chat. So naturally, please, spare me cunt. The cow well hung was only doused in mild chilli. But that's more than sufficient to send my sweat glands into orbit. We walk back the mere two blocks to the office. I feel heat exhaustion lurking nearby. This is ridiculous. The blissful arctic wall of air conditioning in the office foyer is messianic. I feel my shirt instantly unglue itself from each sweat-filled pore of my torso. We continue onto the lift. Joel emerges from the elevator well. Flynn, let's grab a coffee. All right with you, Chris? Sure. Cheers, Chris. I went back to you in a jiffy. He's been behaving himself this morning, I hope. Oh yes, of course. Very well behaved. The big cheese and I turn and head back out into the sauna briefly before settling in a coffee shop. Air conned, thank Christ. What are you drinking then, mate? Better not be too faggy, you fucking homo. A flat white, no sugar. Is that hetero enough? Barely. Two flat whites, please, my dear. To have you. We'll grab a seat over there. Cheers. Keep the change. We take a seat. Joel looks me in the eye for an extended glance. 
I barely know this bloke, but I get the feeling the one thing he may love almost as much as making shitloads of cash is mind-fucking people, for no real reason, other than for the pure pleasure of seeing in confused faces staring blankly back at him. His wish is certainly being granted. I stare back with a mishmash of confusion, fear and awe. First day, big man. How is it? Uh, oh fuck, I don't care. Don't bore me with answering that. Tell me, has Christian taught you all you need to know to be able to fill in for his role now? I guess so, I mean, great. The coffees arrive. Joel wallops his down in one gulp as though he's drinking water during a marathon. Okay, let's go then. Back to work. Huh? Okay, oh, what the fuck? My coffee is full minus one small sip. We walk out and straight back to the lifts, not saying a word. Joel taps out an email on his Blackberry as he joins me all the way back to my desk. Christian is seated, facing his computer but looking down at his friendship band. Chris, the super teacher. Flynn says great things about you. Nothing I didn't already know, of course. I've got some news for you and I need another coffee. You free for five minutes? It's safe to assume when Joel asks a question, he is being politely coy. It's not a question. Yeah, sure. Flynn, just carry on with preparing the hedging plan for the July cargoes. No problem. Chris and Joel walk away. I nurse a headache trying to recall how it was you hedged any cargoes, let alone the July ones. Chris's explanation given to me before lunch must be among the pages upon pages of notes I scribbled this morning. My attention is drawn away from my notes as Chris's three computer screens suddenly black out. Angela arrives moments later and begins going through his filing cabinet, her deranged smile still plastered ear to ear. Hi Angela, are you looking for Christian? He's just out doubt for a moment. No, that's fine. I'm just clearing his desk. What? He's fired. He did very poorly in the trade exam. It's okay. You'll do all his work now. We like you much more. Uh, okay. Cheers. An email pops up on my screen. Christian Kaufmel has left Scion with immediate effect. Joel walks back as I attempt to process the rapid-fire nature of my employer and search my notes for a scrawled explanation on how to hedge these cargoes. Flynn, you're the man now, okay? Chris is gone, the fucking cocky little crack cunny was. You're now the deals desk guy looking after the crude oil team as well as the oil derivatives trader. You got it? You met all those fellas this morning, yeah? Don't fuck it up. Let's grab a pint tonight too. Welcome you to Scion properly. Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I, I met the crude and derivatives guys. That's great, I got it covered. It wasn't a question, little man. I'll grab you on the way out. Get your work done ASAP. I'm thirsty. Can't miss happy hour. Not that I give a fuck, I'm fucking loaded. It's going to be your shout as all, you poor fucker. Oh, righto. Cheers. Joel walks back to his desk, eyes focused on his Blackberry. I'm part chuffed, part frightened, and completely clueless as to what I'm doing, or what I'm meant to do. Three hours with a fucking cocky little kraut cunt was a delightful welcome to the company, and I certainly learned an awful lot. But it wasn't exactly the ideal training I anticipated to enlighten my senses to the nuances of physical commodities trading. I squirm in my seat, straight my tie, and tap my fingers. I doubt it's worthwhile ever trying to get too comfy in a place like this. One blink, head off to a meeting with an executive and you'll likely find yourself back behind the security glass doors, minus the access pass and swollen salary. I spend the afternoon trying to look inconspicuous and not get fired. Cheers to the new boy, Flynn. Joel raises his glass. Cheers. I join the chorus with my new workmates from crude oil and derivatives trading. And why not? Cheers to me. I've asked my way through yet another day. I've not fucked anything up too severely. Even the July hedges were apparently without error. I'm still on track for trading greatness and now have a pint of tiger to lubricate any grave thoughts regarding the churn and burn nature of the industry I'm now a part of. We gathered around a bench in the early evening happy hour glow of an Irish pub overlooking the sullied, steamy waters of Boat Quay. There's an ice cold air conditioned bar inside, completely empty of customers. My drinking buddies couldn't possibly enjoy the indoor comforts. Their nicotine addictions render the great outdoors the only viable location for downing alcohol. The Singapore crew trading team comprises Keith, Wang and Juan Lee. I hope that I don't spend too many hours chuckling at Keith's surname. Obviously, it's hilarious, Wang, gold. But Keith is one fucking serious looking fella. He is Singaporean, but as I'm quickly realising, being Singaporean can mean just about anything. Most likely, it means you're of a Chinese, Malaysian, Indian and English combination of descents. He seems reasonably calm with a pint of tiger in his grasp, but I've watched him through the afternoon inflicting certain ulcers on his gastric lining and brokers alike as he yelled orders and spat instructions down his broker box. My sympathy is with the brokers who mixed up his orders. When Keith speaks, it is incomprehensible unless you are fluent in English and Mandarin, which I guess I am, according to my CV at least. 
Meanwhile, Huan Li is the picture of cool. Sure, he's been dealt a poor hand in the looks department. To a Lord of the Rings fan, Huan resembles a less malnourished Asian version of Gollum. A modelling career was never on the cards, my precious. But he's a silky smooth character, swinging on his tiger, drawing on his Marlborough, chatting with the sort of polished international accent gained from an English college tertiary education mixed with a youth dedicated to US gangster rap. My original interviewer, Andrew, is here too. He trades fuel oil, not crude or derivatives, but felt compelled to pop along for a few pints, having met me at ground zero when I was in the interview stages, as well as to feed his alcohol dependence. He's from Durban, is a rugby fanatic and alarmingly racist considering the two crude traders are quite obviously Asian and standing right next to him. A fellow Australian, Paul Ma, is the oil derivatives trader for whom I'll be deals desking. He's a no-nonsense kind of bloke. Hard on the sleeve, beer in the hand, ciggy in the ear, fists of fury and dispute resolution sort of man. I like him. Within moments of shaking hands and about to wallow in the obligatory small talk requisite when meeting new people, he instead launches into a merciless diatribe of the debacle which is the Mumbai office. They routinely cost him small fortunes by managing to lose his trades. Yeah, his trades just go missing. Between being executed on the exchange and travelling through cyberspace to the world's second most populous nation for settlement reconciliation. These David Copperfield trades then usually turn up moments before expiry or when they've become heavy losses. Fucking beauty. I will now be taking care of all his trades, risk reporting, positions management, etc. And he makes it clear that it will be impossible to be worse than the Mumbaians. But his shouting will be far more intense face to face as opposed to over the phone. So don't fuck anything up, mate. Joel takes charge after the fourth Tiger Pine and says we should dine at a Japanese place nearby. Kinky's. No one argues. Kinky's raunchy title doesn't quite match the sumo wrestler on the restaurant signage. No funny business or pole dancing here. This is a Japanese with an urban attitude restaurant overlooking Marina Bay. We're seated at a table for six of us by the window. It's now 8.45. The Marina Bay light show sprays neon through the night sky and across the harbour as Joel orders a combination of dishes for the group, as well as six asahis, two jugs of sake and asks with a wine menu. Before I have a chance to feign marvel at the light show, plates of sushi, bottles of beer and ceramic cups of sake arrive. Gents, grab your sake. To Flynn, a welcome. Joel leads the way and we each shot our sake in unison. As my first hit of sake makes its way south, Joel is already refilling everyone's ceramics. One more to Paul, Swig, refill. To Keith, you get the picture. Six sake shots in 60 seconds. Nicholas Cage lost in Fukushima. I'm wasted, but the drinks keep coming. Joel is now in possession of three bottles of red, pouring us all hefty glasses in between ordering us to shot more sakis and to eat more faggy sushi. I'm thumped to life by the blaring of my 6.30am alarm on the Blackberry drumming bedside. Piss off. I fling my arm and magically hit the snooze button. Bullseye. I'm lying prostrate, palms by my side facing the ceiling while my neck is jammed at 90 degrees. Peering out from my pillow through the window to the glares of the waking sun next to that fucked up floating serpentine. Hangovers like this shouldn't be possible on a Tuesday morning. I roll over. There is a blonde with flawless fake breasts, zero clothing and crystal blue eyes. I have a very fun night. You're very nice, crazy man. I had such a fun. Who the hell is this chick? And where did she learn English? Her language teacher should be ashamed. Oh, that's great. Listen, um, I have to get to work. I got your number, yeah? You don't want fuck? Um. She rolls my aching body over and straddles me, rubs her cement bolt-ons in my face and with both hands violently pulls her blonde hair towards the ceiling as she arches her back and grinds me. My hangover vanishes as I search alcohol-fortified memory banks for any idea of who this girl is. She starts screaming loud, licking her fingers and telling me to fuck her harder. I try my best. That's all anyone can ask of you, right? And down her in my morning glory with impressive speed. You're welcome. I roll away a load lighter, oddly well prepped for day two on the path to international commodities trading superstardom, and walk to the shower. I try in vain to wash myself. I doubt a liberal dose of Nivea Visage exfoliant over the loins will clean me sufficiently. I hop out, dry off, shave and head back to the kitchen for some breakfast. The blonde, name unknown, is sitting by the kitchen bench in a little black dress and pink stilettos, brushing her head of sex hair and looking extremely whorish. So, you pay me now, yes? Ah, for fuck's sake. The five minute walk to the train platform is more than a tad discomforting. I suppose that's inevitable. It's not customary for my journey to work to include being mistaken for a pimp. 
There's a Citibank ATM at the station. 300 Singapore dollars and this debacle can be over. It's a blessing barely a soul in Singapore actually knows me. Imagine dear Nan was part of the throng of public transporters walking past right now. Sure, I'm copying plenty of raised eyebrows of curious approval from male gawkers, and even though Jesus was praised for associating with prostitutes, I'm fairly certain none of the horrified women walking past will be following me to Galilee. I hand the blonde the cash, not bothering to ask her name. How rude. Though she mustn't care too much for such etiquette. She kisses my cheek and asks me to marry her. I politely decline. Shame. She might have been the one. I escape through the turnstiles and continue solo down to the train platform. I walk up the stairs at Raffles Place Station with the balance of a newborn giraffe thanks to a resurgent hangover beating drums through my temples, while images of bouncing silicone play on repeat in the front, centre and rear of my thoughts. Day two. I'm ready. It takes more than a hangover and the need for an urgent STD test to sour my mood. It's shortly after 8am, and the 24th floor is almost empty. Singaporeans like their beauty sleep, it would seem. Christian's seat has been taken by Sebastian. He smiles as I approach and take my seat next to him. Good morning, Flynn. Good to see you again. Oh, hi, mate. Sorry, I was going to pop over and say hello yesterday. How are you doing? Oh, well, thanks. I started last week. Jenna told me to sit over here with you now. She's going to take the seat on the other side of you today and start teaching us stuff. Well, that's lucky. I've got no idea what's going on. Yeah, me neither. You want to grab a coffee? There's no one here. You might as well sneak out quickly. Sounds good. Sebastian is a week ahead of me on the learning curve, but more important than imparting any newly attained knowledge regarding commodities trading, he leads me straight to where the best coffee in Raffles Place is to be found. We arrive at the Dimbula Coffee Shop, which not only serves up half decent and flat whites, there are also Vegemite and cheese toasties as well as chalky lamingtons on offer. My hangover will wash clean with the first munch of some Vegemite toast. With the revelation of Dimbula, Sebastian has successfully crossed the yoga divide, which I previously thought might prevent us from any chance of a meaningful friendship. Don't get me wrong, yoga is a phenomenal way to view slender women engaged in all manner of leg-spreading, down-dogging and sweaty chanting, but it's no religion. It doesn't offer some divine gateway to the soul, nor should it allow the participant carte blanche to lord their instructor's oneness or pollute bookstores with ever more yoga tomes. It's stretching. That's it. I like stretching. Sebastian is now granted immunity from my hatred if he decides to spit some yoga propaganda my way. You can't grow angry when a man has led you to the promised Lamington land. How have you settled in over your first week, mate? Oh, it's not easy. I am deals desk for the fuel oil traders. I'm very lost. I have experience with trading foreign exchange, bonds, credit default swaps, stuff like that. I wanted to get this job because there seems something special about physical commodities. You feel like you can touch them or something like that, you know? It's real. But it seems to be a real nightmare so far. Things are always going wrong. Oh yeah, I bet. Financial instruments are just numbers on a screen at the core of it. Oil's in a barrel or a tanker or squished in some underground lair somewhere. It's not so easy. And these guys are ruthless too. Most days, someone gets fired. There seems at least one email each day of someone's immediate departure. Somewhere in all our offices globally. I'm told that it's just code for fired. Wow, yeah. The guy who was supposed to be teaching me got fired yesterday afternoon. Oh, I know, I know. Oh, well, what can you do, eh? Ready to head back to work? Yeah, sure. We ride back to level 24 right on 8.30am. The room is still predominantly empty, though Jana is now seated to the immediate left of my spot and is feverishly going about whatever it is she's going about. Sebastian and I continue to our seats, mesmerised by Jana's keyboard tapping staccato concerto and screen-focused tunnel vision. Flynn, good morning. Apologies for not being able to spend some time with you yesterday. In five minutes, we'll have a chat, okay? And I can outline to you all the things expected and what I want you to learn. She refuses to allow this chat to interfere with her concerto or tunnel vision. Okay, great. And Sebastian, I'm just fixing all the mistakes you've made on the July storage and blending analysis. I'll email it back now. Please note the changes. Do not make those same mistakes again, ever. And send me the same analysis for August. It better be perfect. Oh, yes, sorry, of course. The stream of arrivals is increasing. 9am is the Singapore office official starting time. When Angela yesterday completed her HR summary, she outlined claptrap information such as official starting and ending times, lunch hours and the rest of the blah blah theme song. I assumed it was wise to pay no attention. You can't expect to successfully navigate your way through this world if you think being handed the opportunity to earn millions will be coupled with a time punch card. Flint, here's a notebook. Come with me to a meeting room. Pay attention, take lots of notes. This rundown is a one-off affair. You got it? Got it. Half an hour with Jana in the glass bubble corner office meeting room is more than ample for scribbling my way through an entire notebook and sweating off my hangover. Despite being a cocky little kraut cunt, in all fairness to Christian's teaching credentials, he did cover the majority of Jana's material yesterday in an easy-to-understand manner. 
Where is that bloke now, I wonder? A mere 24 hours ago, he was a self-ordained trading natural. I suppose he still is. Only the self component of the ordaining now carries a bit of a delusion crushing sting. One crucial and now rather telling piece of advice missing from Christian's lesson is Jana's emphasis on corporate culture. Flynn, this work is difficult, there is no doubt about that. You need to be fully absorbed with every aspect of every aspect of every fucking aspect of the trader's cargoes, the pricing risks, the potential cost blowouts, the hedging dynamics, the never ending changes to all those assumptions once the vessel is actually underway, and many more things which will become apparent over time. This is very difficult, sure. But the true hurdle for you is this. The traders must love you. I once thought I'd like to be a trader. It sounds impressive. Like being a surgeon or a rock star. And I often know more than the traders. And they like me. Sure. But they don't love me. They don't trust me to go into a meeting or to know how to create opportunities or think clearly once all that risk exposure is on my plate. If you don't want to end up like Christian, you need to be sure the traders love you. Christian was incredibly smart. But he thought he was better than everyone, including the traders. If something went wrong with their trades, he would smirk and try to advise them on how to avoid that scenario in the future. I mean, what an idiot. No street smarts. Listen, okay. Brains, immense intelligence, that's just expected around here. That is why you are here. But it takes more than that to progress. You understand? Yes. Thanks so much for the insight. I really appreciate it. Okay, good. Any questions, you ask me. But ask me twice, I won't answer. Ask me three times, I can fire you. You got it? Got it. I head back to my desk with Jenna's morose attempt of a pep talk behind me. It's 9.15am and the 24th floor is now free of empty seats. The Scion corporate juggernaut is free to launch at full capacity. Joel looks reasonably dusty as I proceed past his desk. I arrive back to my seat and the internal messenger lights up at the bottom right corner of one of my three computer screens. It's the big cheese. What you end up paying for that blonde piece of tart? 300 sing? Ha ha ha, I must be paying you too much. Well, I don't remember bartering, I just woke up and she was in my bed. Hello, morning glory. Good deal, I reckon. She was tasty, you reprobate. What a nine. No idea what happened. Yeah, I love it. Righto. Get busy. Enjoy day two. Any questions, just work it out yourself, you fucking retard. Okay. Sounds easy enough.